now more than ever, we really need to be looking at that whole child piece as we look to return to schools from um, just challenges we, we, we never even saw coming. Um, the experiences that our students and our staff have been going through the past few months, and, and all of you I'm sure as well, um, is gonna impact how we get back to school. So really excited to be part of this conversation and, and, and hope we can, can support um, and give you some good steps moving forward. So um, with this, this is a deep topic, is, is I think everything uh, we kind of get into. So um, I'll do my best to get through um, kind of what I see as some of the most important areas in, in the next hour. Um, but really just getting into, what are we talking about? We're talking about mental health. Um, what's the difference between mental health and mental illness? A lot of times those are often um, included in the conversations that we have. Um, again, there's a number of areas we get into, but just talking about some of the most common issues that we're seeing with our youth. Um, Again, um, I'm not sure you're familiar with, you've probably seen the Vermont Behavioral Risk Assessment, some really good data in there, so I just wanna point some of those pieces out, um, making connections, like I said, to current events, and, and then what do we do? Um, now that we have some of this information, how can we use that uh, to, to keep preparing for the fall and, and, and improve our practices moving forward? So real quick, um, Susan mentioned this, but our Center for Safe Schools, um, we launched, um, we're fairly new, launched back last year in May, um, and really just trying to come back platform to share kind of best practices and resources and have these conversations at the national level um, and through that really about kind of promoting those collaborative relationships um, at all levels so from the state to the board superintendent school and, and members to the conversation as well um, we really try to have those that, that comprehensive approach to meet you know, within our schools but yeah I'm, I'm just getting a little bit of feedback if everyone could just mute me please that'd be great um, these are the areas that we kind of focus on for the center. So um, kind of aligned to some of the things that Virginia was mentioning in her presentation, um, but we kind of broke school safety into these four areas, recognizing that it's such a broad and, and comprehensive spectrum. How can we kind of make this a little more digestible? Um, but from infrastructure, the physical aspects of our buildings, um, our facilities, crisis emergency management, you know, how are we preparing? Um, how are we working to mitigate risk and respond when needed um, in emergency settings? Um, cybersecurity, really looking at, you know, the body of technologies, the, the process and practices that we have designed to protect personal information, but also having students and staff um, be educated and prepared to operate safely in those spaces. And just a little bit of my background, I come from that whole child piece, um, school climate, social emotional learning, restorative justice. So really thinking about, you know, the, the, the child's physical, mental, social, all those comprehensive areas um, that's going to support their well-being and their development moving forward. Um, and the lens that I kind of take into this work, that's why I'm really excited to do this session today, is how does all these other things are necessary to get to that whole child piece and to support our kids. Um, but how are we doing all of that with that lens? Um, one example, I'm going to talk about trauma today. Um, if we talk about trauma-informed practices, it's important to have crisis and emergency and, and emergency operation plans. But are we doing those thinking about our students who may be experiencing trauma? Um, we hear these uh, schools doing drills now where they're doing unannounced drills where somebody comes in and shooting blanks off with a, with a gun um, and think about some of our students and what that might do to them, especially maybe they experienced gun violence in the past. So not to downplay or emphasize any of these, but I really come into this with how do all of these areas play off each other in regards to what we're doing? How can we think about the impact on the student um, and the climate it's going to have with our ability to help support them for success? Um, just a couple resources we have out there. These are kind of aligned to the work that we're doing through the center. So feel free um, to check these out. You can go to the MSBA page and just check the resources. Um, uh, common average child experience. So I would definitely um, dig a little deeper into that if you're interested. That has a really nice lens specifically for the board's perspective. I um, just want to draw those to your attention. So with that kind of background, um, jump right in. And, and this is what we're talking about with mental health. I, I really like the, the, the World Health Organization definition um, and looking at you know, the ability to, to, to cope with normal stresses of life and work productively. Um, where we see these things and kind of the crossover with that whole child piece um, is Virginia also mentioned those drivers of success with safe and supportive schools. So this is going to play right into the. But um, as I kind of opened with mental health and mental health are increasingly used as if they mean the same thing, but they really don't. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit today. But when we talk about mental health, what we're talking about is areas like self-esteem, confidence, um, ability to identify, express, regulate emotions, set and achieve goals, expand knowledge and skills, uh, feeling empathy towards others, being able to create and maintain and have um, safe and positive relationships. And if you think about those things, you have 
any familiarity with the social emotional learning. That really is a lot of those social emotional learning skills that we're talking about. So that's really that crossover. Regina mentioned the SEL piece, um, but promoting mental health and developing social and emotional competencies really go hand in hand in these pieces. And one thing I just want to point out, if we look at kind of the big picture thing, um, just with the, with the SEL piece, is we look at SEL as, as the instructional piece, and that's where we're teaching students some of those skills I just mentioned. Um, and there's not a lot of rigor in the instruction of SEL. Um, you know, it's not, it's not that complicated to teach to a student what empathy is. The rigor in social emotional learning comes in the application. Um, so where we see this most effective is not just having an SEL curriculum, oh, but being able to incorporate into everything we do in our building, social, emotional, academic development. So all of our policies, the way we interact with students, the way we interact with each other, modeling, um, allowing to practice application of these skills, that is how we really focus on SEL, which is such a huge chunk yep. of um, supporting mental health uh, with our students. And again, just what that says right on the top, mental health is an integral piece of overall health. I was a little surprised when Regina brought up the top 10 concerns in Vermont on health, not seeing mental health directly on there, um, but that's what we're gonna dig into this today. So um, just an interesting stat to kind of frame the conversation, but um, when we talk about mental illness, um, what we're talking about is, is, is actual diagnosable um, impacts to our health. So, um, what a mental disorder is going to do, it's going to impact the way that we feel, that we think, that we behave, that we interact with others. Um, and there's many different types of those. Like I said, we're going to talk about just a couple today. Um, but it's going to impact the way that people are able to live their lives. Um, and, and like I said with this, when we're talking about the mental illness, you'll see, we'll see diagnoses and we'll see specific treatments. Um, so again, this kind of frames the importance of what we're talking about. Um, and we're going to dig into this a little deeper throughout the presentation. But um, a couple other areas, one in five youth, um, <clears throat> excuse me, have a mental health condition. Um, and half of those are developed, as you see on this slide, before the age of 14. Uh, the real troubling piece of that is, is again, it's, it's an extremely high number. Um, but looking at just last year, less than half the youth with mental illnesses received any kind of treatment. So that's just going back to looking at last year. Um, and again, if, if these illnesses are left untreated or inadequately treated, the effects can significantly interfere with students' ability to learn, um, to grow, to develop. And since our students spend so much time in our school buildings, um, and even with current events, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at with our schools in the remote setting also, with have, having opportunities to interact with our staff and our supports, um, we really have a unique opportunity to be able to help identify issues at an early age um, and provide support to the students, um, meeting them where they're at. So uh, the first thing also to understand, we talk about developing strong mental health skills, um, the SEL skills, identifying um, mental illnesses, is it's, it's really first about that understanding piece. Um, and from there, it's being able to set up culturally responsive and trauma-informed spaces that are able to meet the needs of each student um, and what they might be experiencing. Uh, this I took from uh, Mental Health America. We do a lot of work with them also. They're a fantastic resource. So if you're not familiar with them, please check their site out and see kind of some of the stuff they have up. Um, but this is their four stages they outline in terms of mental health conditions. And um, if you look at the left side of the stage, that really could relate to any health condition, but this is kind of with that lens of looking specifically at mental health. Um, and as we see, you know, stage one is gonna start with our mild symptoms and warning signs. It's gonna progress, get more severe through two and three, up to where we see the symptoms are persistent and severe and have jeopardized one's life. Um, why I draw attention to this is the way we tend to look at mental health um, in this country is that we're trapped kind of in that stage four thinking, where a lot of what we're doing and what we're responding to is when we're seeing the serious impact and um, the serious systems that are out there. Um, and you know, if we think about other diseases, we think about cancer, heart disease, diabetes, we don't wait years to treat them. We start way before you know, that stage four piece, um, beginning prevention. And again, we start to see the first symptoms, we address them right away. So this is really what we need to be doing and shifting our minds when we look at mental health and serious mental illness. Um, and, and really when we first see some of those stage one, some of those early symptoms is that we can act as quickly as possible. Um, if you're interested in this also, what Mental Health America calls this is they have a whole um, resource and toolkits and everything called up before stage four. So definitely check that out also. Um, so just for kind of some framing, we're gonna talk a little bit about the most common youth mental health issues that we're seeing. Um, 
I'm going to get into really just depression and anxiety and then um, make some connections from there. But as we jump in, you can kind of see this, this table just kind of shows the onset of mental disorders, um, the age of the most common onset. So you can see all of these um, have the potential to have onsets before the age of 20, and some are significantly um, very early in, in students' lives. Uh, and just on the bottom left, if P PDD, if you're not familiar with that, that's pervasive developmental disorders. Um, so that's the group of disorders um, that's characterized by delays in socialization and communication. So if we look at um, disabilities in uh, autism along the spectrum, that's what those PDDs are, are referencing. Um, and like I said, uh, just for framing, we're talking about anxiety and depression coming up. So you can kind of see those are right, right in our formative years um, for our students. This um, shows, again, just, I think, you know, I, most of us have probably experienced some symptoms of depression or anxiety, so it's probably not a shock um, when we look at this. Um, this is not saying diagnosed disorders. This is saying just symptoms. Um, but again, that's where if not addressed, if not treated, if not given those certain skills, um, we're going to see these issues progress and, and, and become more challenging and, and harder to interrupt. Um, and again, uh, it's high in every one of these age categories, but really looking at that 11 to 17 group, um, over 90% over you know, depression and over 80% anxiety. So just really speaks to the prevalence of, of what our students and what kind of everyone's going through. And, and these have only been um, amplified through, through current events. So when we look at anxiety, um, this is essentially excessive irrational dread of everyday situations. So we all probably experience anxiety or one way or another. You can have anxiety and you can have an anxiety disorder. So they are different, um, but really it, it becomes, you know, it can feel uncontrollable and overwhelming and, and can certainly be disabling to those who are experiencing it. Um, and when anxiety gets to that point that it's interfering with daily activities, that's when we get to the point of defining it as an anxiety disorder. Um, and these are real medical conditions. They're serious um, and, and they're common and they're pervasive in our society. And, a lot of our students are struggling with these. And again, when you see this, this is where we also see a lot of self-medication come in, um, where our students are experiencing substance abuse issues at early ages are also dealing with this. Um, so there's a number of different anxiety disorders, um, but it, like I said, it's really around extreme fear or worry. Um, some of those, I'll get into the next slide, but there's general anxiety disorder, uh, panic disorder, panic attacks, social anxiety disorder, um, specific phobias. The next slide will speak a little bit to that. Um, but the difference between normal anxiety and, and, and when it becomes clinically relevant um, has to do with the impact that the anxiety has on the person. Uh, for example, if it's situational and goes away, you probably don't need treatment. But again, when you get to that point where it's, it's significantly impacting your life, it's changing behavior and impacting you to be able to do, do, uh, do your normal things throughout the day, that's when it can be diagnosable. Um, and again, I won't read through all these, but these are kind of some of the more common ones. Uh, that are seen that I just mentioned. Again, students a lot of times will be dealing with that social anxiety, um, general anxiety, um, anywhere across the spectrum. Mental Health America, uh, who I mentioned before, um, another really good resource they have is they have um, an online screening tool. Um, and what it is, it's for and anyone can go on and kind of go through this and um, it's really going to help identify any trouble signs or, um, you know, flag any areas and provide support. So this just kind of frames what um, the students are reporting right now. This is as of um, only a few weeks ago, um, but what they're relating it to. So again, I mean, real serious, obviously with loneliness and isolation, we probably expect that from, from, from um, adolescents, but you can see current events in COVID-19, just how, how high a, a percentage those are um, as well. So next, I want to get just a little bit into um, depression, which again, I think we all probably have a sense of what this is. Um, but again, it's those feelings of, of being discouraged, sad, hopeless. Um, a lot of what we see is, is um, unmotivated behavior, disinterest in life. Um, and again, there's a difference between de symptoms of depression and um, diagnosable depression. Diagnosable depression, again, it's where you're seeing um, or exhibiting these feelings for longer than two weeks. Um, and again, like I said, with anxiety, it's getting in the way of normal functioning and normal activities and having significant impact on the person's life. Um, a big area with this also, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but it's also understanding um, 
the stigma around these things and how much of the work of the school and what we do is, is to really interrupt and address those stigmas. Um, and so much time, I'm thinking back to my own experience in schools, um, we see behaviors of these students and it's, they're just in a funk, they're having a bad day, they're having a bad week, it's just part of growing up, it's just what kids do. Um, and again, if we have that mindset, um, then we're not giving students the support that they need. So just something to really think about as we lean into these things and it goes beyond just anxiety and depression. Those are kind of the forefront of what I see when we start having these conversations. Um, but really, you know, if, it, till we start acknowledging and understanding um, that that's, we can't really provide the adequate support until then. Um, so this again, just, just to give some understanding, there's multiple causes, causes of depression. Um, anything from again, a singular traumatic event to ongoing chronic issues to something like out of our control is genetics. Um, this can be passed on, brain changes, um, and think about all the changes that the ages that we showed in those earlier charts are going through at these times. So um, that's why it's not uncommon to see this at all with, with, with our students. Um, and looking at the symptoms. And what I wanna point out with symptoms also, and this kind of just goes back to that whole school climate and school culture piece, is um, where we, we really need to focus energy is how are we getting our school staff to a point where they understand the importance of relationship and um, not just knowing their students. Um, if I talk about just having trouble with schoolwork, that by itself is not a sign of depression. Lots of students struggle with schoolwork. But if we know our kids and we say that the, some of these are popping up where they haven't been issues in the past because we know our kids, we know what's going on, we know, you know where their norms are, um, that's where we can start to identify these and have that early intervention. So these are often symptoms associated with it, but the biggest thing that's not on here is just knowing if there's a change in behavior, knowing our kids and knowing when something is off or something's different or something's just not right. And again, this goes back to that same screening tool. Um, you can see the numbers are pretty similar to uh, the anxiety, but um, again, the loneliness, isolation, current events, COVID, um, all things that are, that are really strong in our students' minds right now. With this, um, I'm gonna touch just briefly on um, suicide also. When we talk about mental health and, and mental illness, there's a number of implications that this can have. Um, obviously, mentally, socially, physically, the impact it's gonna have on your body. Um, but again, when we think of schools, obviously the most serious thing that I think a lot of us can think of is, is students self-harming or trying to take their own life. Um, it's probably not shocking how prevalent this is. We hear about it all the time, but I think the numbers still speak, speak volumes and help us frame this. Um, and again, it's, it's the second leading cause of death um, for people ages 10 to 34. Um, and that's only behind unintentional injuries. Um, again, looking at that from 2001, a 31% increase. Uh, we'll look at the numbers in Vermont in, in just a moment. Um, and I think what we struggle with now, especially in society, but what I was dealing with just so much as, as an educator and as an administrator, is think about what happened around 2001 and how much more reliant we are now on technology and the emergence of social media and all these areas where students just can't get away from some of the issues they're dealing with. I do not think that is not a direct correlation to why we're seeing those numbers spike. Um, and again, looking outside of our students, even when they're leaving schools, they're leaving schools without these things being treated without um, these mental health skills, without the SEL skills. Again, it's the 10th leading cause of death in the US. And that connection to the mental health, mental illness piece, 46% of people um, who die by suicide have a diagnosed mental health condition. So the number is probably even higher. That's just a diagnose. Um, and 90% of people who die by suicide have experienced symptoms of mental health conditions. So when the numbers are that high, I mean, we can really see the correlation. Um, and, and this is really just something we, we need to interrupt. And, and, and by bringing this more to the forefront, I really think we can. Um, just to have some context, um, I don't like showing those slides and then saying, figure it out. Um, but some of the things we talk about when we talk about um, suicide prevention is, is first, I mean, the best way to deal with suicide in schools is, is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, so how do we do that? Um, one of the areas that's really gaining a lot of traction, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with today is, is a focus on trauma-informed schools. And why I mentioned trauma-informed schools when we're talking about anxiety and depression and social emotional learning and all these other things is, um, Statistically, it's been shown that trauma-informed schools and their practices will benefit all students in these areas. So yes, it's gonna help target and support our students who have experienced trauma and adverse childhood experiences, but they set up the skills and strategies to have these, what you're seeing with the other bullets of safe environments, 
um, welcoming environments, um, and opportunities to do those other things where we're teaching students about mental illness when they know what's going on, when they know other people are experiencing it too, and we take away those stigmas, we can help get them the supports they need. Um, and that last bullet also, um, I mean, this is something we used to do in, in schools, but thinking about finding your invisible students, um, as that says, children who hurt themselves are rarely the students who are already well known to um, administration and staff. Um, so simple activities where either you're meeting as a school or you're meeting by a grade level or in departments, um, if you just list every single student up there and put a sticker next to them if they're involved in a club or an activity or sports, um, or if you have a relationship with that student, put a sticker next to them. And after everybody goes through it, you can see the students who, they might not be getting in trouble and they might not be acting out, but we don't have a connection with those kids. Those are the kids that we really want to pull in, find out who's going, give them support in the building, let them know they're part of the community and welcome. So just a couple things, again, it goes a lot deeper than that, but a couple just little bullet points to think on. Um, I mentioned this, 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 this was um, great that I came across, but the Vermont Risk Behavior Survey. Um, and what this has is um, information on all sorts of um, risk factors that students were surveyed on. So things like suicide to bullying, but do you wear a helmet when you ski and when you snowboard and even into um, risk of sunburn through, do you put on sunscreen when you go outside? Um, but I recommend you check this out if you haven't seen it. Um, some really helpful um, and useful information. This page just shows, excuse me, the, um, this, the breakdown of the students who were surveyed. Um, but tying into what we just talked about with that suicide piece, um, you can see Regina mentioned this, but the numbers in Vermont um, for all of these have been increasing steadily since 2009. So, and again, I mean, this thing that stand out is looking at our LGBT population um, and self-harm is, is half the students reported in this half were engaging in self-harm. Um, and I mean, I think these numbers kind of speak for themselves. We, we obviously want them to be zero. Um, these are not really any worse than the national average. Um, but again, any, any is too many. So just some framing. Um, I do bullying also, so I always see the connection to, we're talking about suicide prevention or mental health and supporting our students, school climate, school culture. So I just always like showing these numbers. Um, again, these have been pretty consistent. And also what's, what's nice to see is a significant drop um, from ninth grade to 12th grade. So um, clearly something we're doing in our buildings to, to interrupt and address these is working. Um, and the other one is school connectedness. So I kind of mentioned this uh, a little bit with, with, with speaking about um, our invisible students. Um, but, you know, these, these look kind of high, but if, if, we, if we look at them backwards, um, we're really seeing, you know, one in, one in four, um, one in five students feel they don't have anyone in their schools they can talk to. Um, and that's pretty substantial. I mean, that's, that's Regina talked about, again, students identifying with teachers, um, and again, how they're going to identify better with teachers who look like them. But just think about that. One in four, one in five students are not having a relationship with staff members in their buildings. Um, and it's even lower when we look at what's going on in the community. So um, definitely, I think this is one of the most impactful um, data points that I came across when, when I looked through, through this report. Um, so I'm going to transition. Um, and I mentioned trauma-informed a couple times. Um, and when I was talking about... Um, is mental health and mental illness. Um, I think a lot of the really strong work right now is being is, is around these practices and trauma informed schools um, and the work being done looking at adverse childhood experiences. So Dr. Melissa Saden, um, she's another person we do a lot of work with. She works with the Attachment and Trauma Network. Um, she is a, a, a trauma expert, a trauma informed school um, expert, and she's also a board member in New Jersey. So she has a very similar lens to the conversations that that we'll dive into. Um, but I love this example that she has. So uh, I'm gonna explain that picture. I didn't just put it up there because uh, it looks fun. Um, but she has this reference where she talks about lions and ducks. Um, and what we mean by that is, is, is try to imagine that our schools are ponds. So in the ponds, as you can see, we have our ducks and we have all different kinds of ducks. Ducks of different shapes, different sizes. Um, we think about our students, we have ducks with autism, ducks with dyslexia, um, gifted ducks. And we've been very good at, over the past, and um, kind of as education has evolved, is meeting the needs of these ducks. But the issue is, is who else is in there? We have lions in the ponds as well. Um, and the, the reality is they have different needs, they eat different things, um, and that pond is not set up to support a lion. 
So what's going to happen if you drop a line in the pond? They're going to do one of three things. They're going to freeze. They're going to stop eating, stop what they're doing, and probably just drown in that pond. They're going to flee, where they're going to go looking for food and tall grass and whatever else they need somewhere else that that pond can't meet. Or they're going to fight. They're going to start attacking and eating ducks for survival. Um, and with that example, clearly the lions are our students of trauma. Um, and basically what, why, why she used that example is trauma actually changes brain development um, and how students respond. And as a result, we have to change the way that we treat and support them. Um, it's not about um, giving them different skills. It's about working with the way that their brain has developed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, why I like to spend time on this is because what the research is showing is when we set our schools up to be trauma-informed, incorporate trauma-informed practices, it's not just helping the lions, it's helping the ducks too. So they really are developing those skills and helping mental health supports for all students involved. Um, so from there, again, um, this, this is stuff we could dive very, very deeply in, but giving a sense of what we're talking about, we talk about trauma and what we talk about with developmental trauma. Um, Dr. Bessel van der Kirk, uh, is the one who came up with the diagnosis for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and basically, um, he did the work to get that into the DSM, uh, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that is where disorders are diagnosed. If it's not in that book, it's not, you can't give a cl clinical di um, diagnosis on it. Um, but the reason why I put that on this slide is because it's different than developmental trauma. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a single event that changes the stress response or system of a person affected. Um, so when they're impacted by stressors, they're gonna react in different ways and that can definitely lead to very serious things, getting sick, depression, um, how they act, um, how they feel. Um, but what developmental trauma is, is exposure to any of those bubbles that you see on the right side of your screen before the age of 18. Um, and it can happen periodically over time, it can be, um, once a year, it could be weekly, it could be daily. Um, but looking at PTSD and the difference, PTSD doesn't change the way that your brain works. That developmental trauma, when you experience those things before the age of 18, we see shifts in the way that the brain develops and how it responds. So um, ACEs is probably a term that, that you've heard. It's, it's, it's been around for a while now, but um, it's definitely growing, gaining a lot more traction recently. Um, and this goes back to a 1997 study by Dr. Andon Paletti. Um, and this was kind of a groundbreaking study that looked at the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences in 17,000 college students. Um, and what the study found was that 64% of the students surveyed reported being exposed to at least one of the items on the slide when they were children. Um, as a note, poverty is on there in red. That was not part of the original study. Um, that was added later um, by Andon Folletti in uh, 2005. Um, but these all fit within the definition of developmental trauma that Dr. Vanderkroll came up with. So when we talk about ACEs and adverse childhood experience of developmental trauma, we, we can kind of use those terms interchangeably. Um, and what Andon Folletti also found was that ACEs had direct impacts on adult health outcomes. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Um, but if you have three or more of these on this list, um, there is, is serious correlations to some specific health, health issues um, later in life. Um, one other thing I want to point out also is divorce is on this list, um, but divorce by itself is not considered an ACE. So what I mean by that, I don't want anyone that, that experienced divorce or is going through a divorce to think that you're traumatizing your kids. Um, if it's just that and that's the only factor going on in a household, that has not been shown um, to show up as an ACE and have the same impact on students. Now, if it's paired with any of those other items, so there's physical and emotional abuse going on in the home while the divorce is going on, then that's put into it. Um, so I just like to make that clarification also. Um, and this just kind of shows the breakdown of where those ACEs are occurring. So again, I mean, just think about how many, think of our kids, one in four with experienced substance abuse in the household. Um, again, uh, the physical abuse over one in four. So this just gives a little framing on some of the things that our students are experiencing. Um, and one other thing I, I like to throw out, I don't think I mentioned, but, um, Thinking about this and, and how we do our practice moving forward is, 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 and our invisible students is also the invisible backpack. We're, we're just not knowing what our kids are coming in with. Um, we all carry it around, everyone, our, ourselves, our staff, our teachers, um, but everything going on in our lives that we're walking into our schools with, um, so often getting wrapped up in the day-to-day -day inside of school building is we lose sight of that. Um, so I really like just to spend a little bit of this time to remember this is some of the things that our students are, are constantly bringing in with them and carrying around with them all day. Um, 
we know the, 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 the breakdowns in Vermont, Virginia spoke really well towards that. Um, so there is um, evidence that um, black children and Hispanic children um, see higher prevalence of ACEs, but again, this ACEs impact everybody. It's seen across all races, it's seen across um, all socioeconomic statuses, it's seen in rural communities, it's seen in urban communities, suburban. So um, even though some are higher than others, again, 40%, um, white children experiencing at least one ACE is, is, is very significant. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little background on kind of, I, I mentioned that it changes brain development. So what I mean by that, um, but this picture just represents the, the limbic system. So um, kind of just a, a, a simple breakdown of our brain. Um, and you can see on the bottom, the amygdala, that's our survival brain. Sometimes we call it the lizard brain. Um, it's the automatic responses, the fight, flight, freeze responses. Uh, moving up to the hippocampus where we see emotional regulation, memory, language development, a lot of those skills that we need specifically for schools. Um, and again, in that prefrontal cortex where we see logic, reason, choice, decision making. Um, I'm not sure you've seen the example we use a lot when we, when we talk about uh, losing control with our emotions, but if you try to do your, um, your brain, we have our brainstem here at the bottom, our amygdala up where our brainstem meets the brain, our hippocampus in that kind of central section and the prefrontal cortex covering it. Um, and then we talk about what happens when you get upset, you see red, you lose control, you flip your lid. So then we're looking at all those things on there um, at the, those lower level functioning. So just very quick example, because um, when we see trauma, this is what happens. So those pictures um, are from an MRI. And if you know MRIs, they're videos. So, and the brain is constantly firing in different parts and different switches going off. So um, a, a 2D picture is not the best example, but for the sake of this, I think it gets the point across. Um, and basically, you know, what, what your brain is, is, is a very, very complex system of switches that fire and some switches turn on other switches and go through all these areas. But the parts that you're seeing on here um, and going back to, to this slide here is our, our amygdala. So again, that survival brain, that instinctive piece is um, the bottom of that picture. So at six o'clock on a clock is where you would see your amygdala. The hippocampus is those side sections. And then the prefrontal cortex is on the top. So if we think about first, we're seeing more activity in the amygdala. So students who experience trauma, essentially they get trapped in that fight, flight, freeze response. And it can, it can cause the brain to continue firing that as they develop and as they grow. Um, and you can see, you know, very little on the sides and the top, and especially, you know, look at the difference in the prefrontal cortex all the way at the top of those pictures um, where decision-making and choice and all of those areas are, are coming. So um, it's, it's, it's it really, when you see it like that, it's not about the student lacking skills or um, lacking desire or any of those areas. It's, 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 it's how their brain is functioning. Um, and another thing I talk about, um, um, you know, you know student behavior, that, that ties into this is um, you know, doing behavior. I always talk about student baseline behavior. Um, and the goal of us in terms of change behavior is to essentially work on where that baseline is. Um, and oftentimes when you hear that baseline, when you say it to a teacher, they hear that as this is acceptable behavior. The kids at their baseline, this is acceptable behavior in my class. Um, but based on where kids are, based on the skills, based on the experiences they're coming in with, that kid that comes in and throws his backpack across the classroom and kicks his chair out, that might be their baseline. All that means is they're not at, for them, a state that's elevated or agitated or depressed. So it really is about, if we're talking about not having developmental trauma or developmental issues, addressing the needs and building skills out to help lower that baseline. Um, and if we are talking about these things, we need to look at how we're um, working with these students who might have a difference in brain development. Um, so again, I mentioned this a couple of times, this goes back to, to our line in, um, in the pond example. But these are the, exam the things that we'll see with impacts of trauma is we're going to see more of these um, bullet points that fall under fight, flight, freeze responses. Um, that amygdala is constantly firing, which is sending these messages to the student. So this is what we see. Um, and think about also with this, um, what are students most commonly referred to? If you gave a list, I would say most of the things are on here. Um, Regina talked about oppositionalism and those things, defiance. Um, so what are we doing for our students when we're using traditional forms of discipline, um, removing them from classroom settings, removing them from these areas, when again, it's not even a lack of skill at this point, um, it's in terms of how their brain is firing, how their brain is functioning. 
Um, just a couple more bullet points on this, but you can see um, some of the impacts that we see through academics, two and a half, four times more likely to fail grade school. Um, but going back to just what I just said, 32 times more likely <clears throat> to have behavioral problems in school. Um, and the reality is, is, is when we're using traditional forms of discipline on that way, we're just reinforcing and reinforcing behaviors. Um, and that's a really clear connection also to what Regina mentioned with more serious issues like the school to prison pipeline. Um, again, I'm going to talk about the physical stuff in a minute, but connections to that. Um, and again, just the emotional pieces, it, it, inability to regulate emotions, develop trust, understand ourselves and others, and think about the skills that you need to be successful in school um, and beyond. So uh, what this comes from, that wheel on uh, the right side um, <clears throat> was done by Dr. Wade in 2016. Um, and you can kind of understand where you fall on this very quickly. Um, the way you can, you can assess your ACEs is just going back to that chart that has all of them on there. If you've experienced any of those, that's one ACE. And when you add them all together, that's how you get your ACE score. Um, what the chart on the right by Dr. Wade shows um, is again, that number that I mentioned of three, if you've had three or more ACEs before the age of 18, this is the percentage of these types of um, risks that you might, you might, be, um, uh, might be exposed to. So for example, um, on the bottom right, if you had three or more ACEs, you would be 67.2% more likely to have life dissatisfaction. 25.5% um, more likely to have cardiovascular disease. And that pyramid on the left kind of explains how that happens. So we start with the trauma, we start with the adverse childhood experiences, it's gonna change brain development. Again, as we see in the middle of the purple, it's gonna then impact your social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. And then we see more at-risk behaviors, which can then result in all those issues we see on the right side of that wheel. Um, so with this, it's really important to first kind of assess where we're at um, and know where we are in our own risk. Um, but, I think also looking at these, these, these on the wheel, these are some of the most prevalent issues that we see in our society. So kind of reframing our thinking of how many of these and what we're seeing might just be tied to those early childhood experiences and brain development, not intervention. What's promising about this um, is this goes back to Dr. Ann and Folletti also, is uh, what they say is, is, is what is predictable is preventable. And what they mean by that is if you're aware of your ACEs and you take steps to um, support yourself through those, you can greatly reduce those risk factors. So those are not locked in. It's if you don't know about them or you don't act on them or you don't care, that that's where those percentages come from. But again, what's predictable is preventable. So if you're aware and you take steps, you can greatly reduce those risks, which again is a big piece of um, what we're trying to accomplish with trauma-informed schools. So uh, current events, again, we think about the things we talked about, anxiety, depression, trauma. Um, I don't think I have to go too deeply into how we're seeing connections to what we're seeing now, whether it's coronavirus, social unrest, protests, whatever it might be um, that we're seeing, but 2020 is, has totally turned our schools upside down. Um, you know, the, the, through COVID, um, it's destroyed routines, it's increased feelings of, of, of loneliness that we saw through those student surveys, anxiety, uh, fear. Um, and you know, with these, we can only expect those other areas to grow, to grow also. So depression, anxiety, everything is kind of impacted through those feelings. Um, and, and what we're seeing is more prevalent in those issues. We're seeing new students that didn't have mental health issues emerging with mental health issues. Um, and an important thing also to think about is it, it's almost a perfect storm where on one hand, we're losing access to our students at home who the school might be their only support system, it might be where they're receiving services or all these areas, and, and schools are doing a lot of very hard work to meet those needs at home, um, but it's a challenge and it's not always the same. And if we think back, just looking at the ACEs on what our students are experiencing, and a lot of that happens in home and outside of the school, um, they're being exposed to these traumatic environments on a much more regular basis without any break. So this is something we really need to be aware of as we, as we plan to come back in the fall and, and have students return from extended absences is that um, you know, we might be seeing new challenges, um, amplified challenges, and, and just a, you know, a whole array um, that we need to be prepared for as we come back. Um, <clears throat> so looking back, um, what I would say just in terms of looking at um, you know, current issues going back a little bit is it's really about 
um, creating a sense of safety, connectedness, and hope. Um, I think that's really where we should be leaning in right now um, with our schools, with supporting our students, with supporting our families. Um, but first is meeting the basic needs of our students with that safety piece. And so many schools are doing this. So think about how we're feeding um, our students that are only getting their meals at school throughout the day, um, just how communities have fully come together to help support those things, but meeting those basic safety needs first. Um, how are we continuing to support services, whether it's in person, whether it's virtually, um, you know, getting feedback from students and families to know where they need help, giving them open lines of communication, um, opportunities to connect, um, which goes into that connectedness piece, you know, how are we being able to foster relationships with others that, that understand, that can provide just that lane of support? Um, how are we giving opportunities for our families to connect, for our students to connect with us, to connect with each other? Um, <clears throat> you know, encouraging, you know, sharing, you know, good stories also, sharing what's going on in the news. Um, and that's that hope piece. You know, it, it's, we are gonna come back. It may not look the same, but we're gonna come back. We are gonna get through this. Um, sharing success stories, sharing, you know, um, times this has happened before in history and how we've gotten through it. So the more information I think is, is really the better. Um, and then also encouraging students and families, you know, kind of to take a break. It, it can certainly be overwhelming with the news and everything, and especially um, having all these updates coming, you know, at the, at the touch of a button on your phones. So really encouraging and giving skills to take a break and be able to kind of decompress and focus on your own health through these times. Um, so, what we do now also kind of looking at next steps um, and, and where we can get into things. Um, one, one really key area is, is culture responsive mental health supports. Um, looking at, you know, I'll give an example of, of doing social emotional learning work in, in DC public schools um, and, and the feedback we got primarily when we brought, you know, curriculums and that we thought were strong curriculums was that they didn't address the needs of the student population in those buildings. Um, and again, students learn, like Regina said, from, from people who look like them, from people with shared experiences. Um, so we have to bring that into how we're supporting um, our students. And um, it's not just about diversity. Um, that, that, that's a very key area. So when we talk about this, and we have students of a number of different races, we wanna make sure that, that we are culture responsible to their needs, stigmas that might you know, be a part of each race or, or various religions, but it goes beyond that. Um, you know, we have people from, again, rural to urban to suburban backgrounds, um, socioeconomic statuses. Even if we're predominantly white, we have white people of different backgrounds. So how are we really addressing those? And what that means is um, it's, it's really just vital to the support of each student's needs. Um, and looking at, you know, how do we honor and respect beliefs, language, interpersonal styles, behaviors of individuals within the whole community? Um, and, and it's really about just developing cultural competency. And cultural competency goes beyond just learning facts. Um, it's really, just, it's an ongoing process and it starts with that cultural awareness and, and our own cultural awareness. So we can look at, at our own upbringing and our own experiences and our own culture and how that impacts how we view others. Um, but it, it's, it's then taking that time to learn about who we're serving um, and all those areas that I just talked about and how we can incorporate into, into these areas. So again, not just to look at this as, as are we looking at different races, but thinking about how well do we know our students and our background um, and do our staff have the skills to understand where they're coming from and help to meet those needs. Um, I mentioned stigmas a couple times, um, but really with this, um, this is one of the largest barriers in terms of students getting support. Um, fear of how they'll be received, not knowing what they're going through or what they're experiencing, not understanding it, um, keeps people from speaking up or knowing what steps to take or how to support. Uh, so just a couple of things that, that you can work in is thinking openly about, talking openly about mental health. It's not something that we shy away from. Um, it's something that's part of our community. We know people are experiencing it. We're gonna have open conversations about it. Um, that education piece, what do our curriculums look like? If we look at our health education curriculum, is there an intentional focus on understanding mental health and mental health supports. Um, it's such, I started as a health teacher, um, it's such a unique space to be able to have those experience with students and explain to them and, and practice strategies. We talked about SEL and application. It's such a great setting for, be able, for students to be able to um, apply what they're learning. Um, so are we intentional in developing our curriculum and supports around that? Um, you know, being conscious and showing compassion, how is this reflected in our policies? 
Um, this is something I'm gonna say probably a few times, but it's not just about having a policy around mental health um, or something that's gonna address stigmas. Um, it really is something that needs to be incorporated into everything that we do and do all of our policies reflect this. We talk about social emotional learning. It's not about picking a social emotional curriculum. Um, it's do we represent these, these, these skills and these values ourselves? Are we teaching it just to our kids or are we embodying relationship building from the top down in our district? And is that reflected in what we're putting out there and how we expect others to act? So again, whether it's SEL, specific mental health, mental illness support, um, any of those areas is, is not just having a policy around that, but how is it reflected in the policies that we already have? Um, so looking at these areas, um, I, I, another quote from Dr. Satan that I love is, is, is the first step, I think, is also just thinking about how we look at things and shifting that mindset. So oftentimes we see students that are struggling, um, not, not getting work, not responsive, getting into disciplinary issues, and the question is, what's wrong? What's wrong with that kid? Um, and we really need to change that mindset that it's not about what's wrong, it's about what's happened. Um, all behavior is driven by needs. So, I mean, we could look at it and, and we could have the same response to all of it, or we can set up policies and practices to help staff identify needs and then meet those needs. Um, so, are, you know, are our policies aligned to that intentional focus on school climate? Um, do, distant, do distant policies reflect that? Are we incorporating things like Regina mentioned with restorative justice? Um, I mentioned the curriculum, you know, are we looking at our curriculum? Are we looking at a focus on mental health? Um, are we developing staff capacity within that? Are they getting the same training to understand what these are? And not just, you know, kind of a one and done, but to work on their competencies throughout and that, con that continued learning piece. Um, and again, also uh, community partners is huge with this. Are districts aware of what their community partners are, who they are, what they do, um, and how we can do a better job of finding wraparound services within our building. Um, Multi-tiered system support I'm gonna get to here. Um, there's, there's a number of different models within having a tiered system of support. Um, I think three is fairly simple and, and gets the point across. Um, but looking at how we're providing supports, whether we're talking about school culture, school climate, discipline, mental health support, I mean, we can break this down into, into a little simpler terms. Um, and what this looks with, with the three-tier approach is that first tier is those research-based core instruction interventions. Those are universal supports. So if we talk about social emotional learning, social emotional learning is for all students. It's gonna help a student who is first in their class and has had no issues throughout. Um, it's gonna help them be prepared for, for when they might fail for the first time in college or all these other things. Um, it's also for the students who are struggling. It's, it's, it's a universal support. It's not for any one subset of students. As you move up that triangle, you get to tier two, which is the more targeted interventions. And again, lastly, the, the, the intensive interventions. And what we see a lot of times in schools, what's actually going on when we look at the data, is that this triangle is flipped upside down, where all of our time and energy is being put towards those handful of students um, that might need the most support, that might be having the greatest impact on the school climate. Um, dealing with behavior work, this is definitely what we dealt with, again, um, when I was doing student behavior, is our time was set to like 20 or less students of just trying to work with them all the time, all the time, all the time, and we weren't working on those other approaches. So think about where it is, look at your data on how you're actually implementing these things. Um, restorative justice is another good example on kind of how you can work through the tiers. Um, as I mentioned with my answer in the, in the keynote, it's not just about responsive circles or using it when harms happen. You can do community building circles. That can be for everyone. You can do it about creating understanding. You can do about what's going on current events right now are impacting everybody. Um, those targeted interventions might be smaller group settings. We have students who are struggling with truancy or struggling with similar issues. And again, that tier three, that individualized um, higher level support. So just a way to break down, this is something that again, can, can, can very easily be worked into policy. Um, if you think about what you want and what you expect in each of these levels of support. Um, circling back again, just to um, the piece of trauma-informed schools. Um, a lot of this goes to education and, and work on school climate, but like I said, that trauma-informed piece helps support all students and, I, and, and it's a really strong model. Um, and I think by looking at these definitions, you can kind of see how, how they meet the needs of all students. Um, if you're interested also, just a couple other resources, um, this, there's one on the page, but Attachment and Trauma Network, I mentioned with Dr. Satan is a very strong resource. 
Um, and then uh, this comes from SAMHSA. So um, SAMHSA is uh, the substance abuse, um, mental, I'm gonna blank, blank on it now. Substance abuse, mental health services. I usually have that. But what SAMHSA put together is um, a full guide on uh, trauma-informed practices. So it's a, it's a very extensive um, resource. And these are just some areas that uh, pull out of it. So again, if we think about the areas of trying to break down stigma and support universal mental health, I mean, think about how these areas fit in, even though we're talking about a trauma-informed school. So that creation of sense of safety, trust and transparency, um, you know, collaboration, bringing decision-making power, empowerment of voice and choice, um, just how impactful that can be, again, just looking at, at stigmas and bringing people to the table and having this become part of um, just what we do and what we're about. Um, another big key area that, that um, Sam's have focused on that I think is really strong is the four R's of trauma-informed schools. They actually have it um, for any organization. It's not unique to schools, but we're talking about schools. Um, and we've done kind of some of these steps already. Um, you know, talking about the, the prevalence we've done through um, understanding, you know, how many students are experiencing ACEs and, and what's out there shifting over to recognizing the impact, you know, the long-term effects, how it impacts brain development. These are things that we work on with staff to build out their understanding, their realization, their recognition. Um, moving to the bottom of the wheel, again, resisting re-traumatization. Going back to my first example of something just um, as, as front and center of how are we doing our active shooter drills and are we re-traumatizing students through that? But um, the more we know about trauma and our students and their experiences, um, it could be just very simple language that might be used by staff members. Um, it could be very simple. I had a student um, when I was doing safety and security, um, and we, we butted heads for a very long time. Um, and we, you know, when we finally sat down and worked with, with the full student support team um, and looked at his IEP and broke it down, he had um, problems with authority was written directly into his IEP. So me being the person that's giving out suspensions and discipline and all these different things in the building, him just seeing me was re-traumatizing him as that authority figure. So we had to totally rethink what our approach was and it wasn't me coming in and getting in his face cursing at him, it was just him seeing me would set him off down a whole path that would take us the rest of the day to get out. So we had to really rethink about how we were doing those things. Um, and then responding and, and fully integrating you know, everything into policies and practice. And that's kind of what I mentioned already. Um, whether we're talking about mental health, we're talking about SEL, whether we're talking about trauma, um, it's not just about having a policy directly towards that. It is how are we looking at all of our policies and practices through this lens. So regardless of what we're talking about, how are we putting this lens on it and how are we coming out to make sure this is not just something we have, this is something we believe and this is something we all embody within our district. So shifting now uh, to school boards, um, obviously the first thing as Regina mentioned is, is thinking about you know, that intentional allocation of resources. Um, and she did point out that Vermont is spending more, significantly more per pupil um, on student supports than, than the national average. Um, but how intentional about that are we um, in terms of where it's going and, and what we're using it for? So um, a couple things to think about is, is whether we're talking about, you know, mental illnesses or just promoting positive mental health skills. It has to be prioritized as a district goal. Um, and, and going back to just incorporating to everything, there's not another district goal that, that's going to be impacted or offset by changing this lens on how we look things and having um, a, an, an intentional approach to supporting mental health and mental illness. Um, and again, think back to what we opened with, with that stage four thinking um, and, did, and how do we shift away from only responding to when we see... When I signed up for it, it seemed like a great idea, but I hate sitting here. Yeah. Plus, I got another whole day tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, with this again, like looking at professional development of staff, um, I'll get through so we have some time for questions. Uh, creating understanding of what students are going through, how it impacts their behavior and, and development, right. how it can support them to do better. Sorry? Okay. Um, but yeah, and also with it is the intentional focus on school climate and culture that's gonna really tie all these things together. With budget considerations also, I mentioned being aware of community resources, wraparound services, they play a, a, a significant role in being able to support our students in these areas. Um, and even mentioning that student support piece, um, how is it being 
you know, utilize to meet those specific needs that we're seeing through the data within our, within our individual districts. Um, the discipline policy keeps coming up. Again, there's such a disproportionate um, amount of students um, experience mental health issues and mental illness that um, end up in um, with more severe discipline. So how are we thinking that? How are we understanding where they're coming from um, and meeting their needs? Do our school codes of conduct match these? Um, and again, it, it doesn't need to, it can be a specific policy, but it's going to interact with everything is how are um, everything we do creating that caring and supportive environment. <clears throat> and uh, lastly, I've said this a couple times, um, but it really is also about the full school and community approach. It's not just focusing on teachers. It's not just trying to get more mental health staff and buildings to support on that. It's, it's really about getting everybody on the same page about understanding and how we can meet these and, you know, including families, community members, and like I said, those wraparound services. Um, so like it says right there, but you know, research has shown the quality of school climate may be the single most predictive factor in any school's capacity for most student achievement. Um, so how are we really getting a sense of what's going on within our own areas and, and, and what can we do to address them? So um, just a couple real quick resources. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, we have just speaking about kind of current events, uh, we did a roundtable discussion with the Attachment and Trauma Network, uh, specifically about um, the impacts on shifting to a virtual environment and, um, and what we can do uh, planning forward. Uh, that's on our website, um, which is just um, NSBA, the number four safe schools. Um, and if we have a resource section with a number of webinars on there, but that's one of them. And then we also have an event coming up, um, a virtual event, September 16th and 17th, our first safety summit. And we're focusing primarily um, on supporting whole child health. So we have Dr. Sade will be one of our speakers, um, Mark Brackett and Scott Levy, who are the executive directors from uh, the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale, um, but we're sort of justice experts in down the line. So please feel free to check that out. Um, as well, if you'd like to dig in a little more with some more experts on these areas. So I know that that was a lot to try to get through in the amount of time, but um, I will open it up to, to questions. Susan? I am here. All right. Thank you very much. We are tight on time. We're scheduled to end now at, at 4.45. Um, Michael, yes, the slides will be available to everybody. All of the slides from all of the presentations today um, and the sessions are also being recorded. And so you'll get all of the information on that. Um, we'll take two minutes. If anybody does have any questions, please type them into the chat. Um, and otherwise, I'm not seeing any yet. So Adam, I just want to thank you very much. This was a really important topic and a difficult one. Lots of difficult things to be talking about these days. And so thank you very much for your expertise and your wisdom on the topic. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who has been participating today. I know this is a different kind of conference for all of us. Uh, so far, we're hanging in there. So thank you for hanging in with us. We are concluding today's program and we will be back tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning with a focus on what's, real, what's going on in Vermont now that we've got this national and uh, global perspective against which to put our local story. So thank you very, very much, Adam. We really do appreciate your participation in our, in our conference. Thank you for having us. Um, and again, feel free. Um, I know it's the end of the day, but reach out directly or, or indirectly. Um, any questions, any way we can support. So thanks again for having us. Thank you very much.